Commissioner, we move now to a, a new topic in these hearings, which is a topic about improper conduct on the part of financial advisers. Uh, and the first witness is Mr. Andrew Hagger from NAB. Yes, yes, Mr. Young. Uh, is Mr. Hagger in court? Oh, yes. Mr. Hagger, would you come into the witness box? Can I ask you, Mr. Hagger, whether you'd prefer to make an oath or take, uh, be affirmed? Uh, an oath, please, Commissioner. Swear the witness, please. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Haggard. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Young. Um, is your full name Andrew Paul Hagger? Yes. And your business address is 700 Burke Street, Melbourne, in Victoria. Yes. Your current position is Chief Customer Officer in the Consumer Banking and Wealth Management Division of the National Australia Bank Limited? Yes. And have you received a summons to appear and give evidence before the Commission, being a summons dated the 20th of April 2018? Uh, yes, I have. And do you have the summons with you? Uh, I believe so. I I tend to the summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.177 is the summons to Mr Hagger. Uh, Mr Hagger, uh, have you prepared two witness statements? Yes, I have. Yes. Is the first of those a witness statement dated uh, the 5th of April with respect to rubric 2-9? Yes, it is. Uh, do you have a copy of that statement with you? Uh, yes, I do. Now, I'll ask you next about the second statement before I tender it. Have you also prepared a statement dated the 13th of April 2018 in response to rubric 2-21? Yes, I have. And you also have a copy of that statement with you? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, in respect of each statement, do you have a, uh, a clean copy and a redacted version of the copy to accord with confidentiality rulings? Uh, I do for 2.9. Yes. In relation to 2.21, I have... Um, I'm not exactly sure. I've got two folders called originals. All right. Um, uh, I think you have a clean copy of 2.21, uh, have you? The second of the two statements? Yes, uh, but both say unredacted. That's yes. all right. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, now, can I ask you about the first statement of the 5th of April? Yes. Uh, are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. Uh, Commissioner, I tend to that statement, which includes Exhibit AH1, which is a bundle of tabulated documents. Witness statement of Mr Hagger, dated 5 April 18, and Exhibit uh, concerning Rubric 2-9, Exhibit 2.178. Uh, as to the second statement, Mr Hagger, dated the 13th of April 2018, are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Uh, I likewise tend to that statement, Commissioner, and it includes, in this case, Exhibit AH2. Witness statement of Mr Hagger and Exhibit dated... Uh, witness statement of Mr Hagger dated 13 April uh, 18 concerning rubric 2-21 and its exhibit uh, is Exhibit 2.179. Thank you. Yes, Ms Orr. Uh, Mr Hager, uh, you were appointed to the role of Chief Customer Officer in the Consumer Banking and Wealth Management Division at NAB in August 2016. Yes, I was. Uh, by the way, can I just say up front, I apologise for my croaky voice, uh, Commissioner Mizzle. Uh, survive, Mr Hager. The question whether you survive with your croaky voice. <laughs> <laughs> In that role, Mr Hagger, you lead approximately 7,000 NAB staff in the Consumer Banking and Wealth Management Division. Yes, I do. And you're part of NAB's 11-person group executive leadership team. Yes, I am. And you've been put forward by NAB to give evidence about a number of topics, but um, relevantly about NAB's financial adv advice business. Yes. And apart from financial advice, what else is the Consumer Banking and Wealth Management Division responsible for? Uh, it's responsible for the branches of NAB, um, the mortgage brokers, um, the contact centres or the call uh, centres, uh, the digital 
uh, bank of uh, Ubank, our digital bank. So uh, it covers both uh, banking and wealth. And as Chief Customer Officer, what are your main responsibilities? Well, we overall have five million customers um, as all in the consumer uh, arena in Australia. And so uh, my role is to uh, serve those customers through the activities that uh, I just mentioned, the, the branches and the brokers and the uh, financial advisors and uh, the contact centres and our digital banks. So uh, my, my role is to serve customers through those channels. Um, NAB operates its financial advice business through NAB Financial Planning uh, and through other entities that are wholly owned by NAB, which each have their yes. own financial services licence? Yes. Okay. And the two largest parts of the financial advice business are NAB Financial Planning and GWM Advisor Services? Yes. All right. Um, NAB currently has about 400 financial advisors. In NAB financial planning, yes. Yes. And direct, yes. Uh, and you are also, you tell us in your statements, a director of JB Ware? Yes, I'm the chair of JB Ware. And you're a director of MLC Limited, in which NAB has a 20% interest? Yes, I am. Has NAB always had a 20% interest in MLC Limited? Uh, in, well, NAB acquired MLC Limited around 2000, and then uh, around uh, October, 2016, uh, NAB completed a transaction with Nippon Life in which uh, Nippon Life owns 80% of MLC Limited and NAB owns 20%. How many NAB officers or employees are on the board of MLC Limited? Uh, one. I, I'm the NAB representative on uh, the board and I have an alternate uh, director, Mr Simon Moore. Thank you. Uh, now, one of the statements that you've provided to the Royal Commission deals with improper or dishonest conduct yes. by NAB financial advisors, yes. such as by forging customer signatures, impersonating customers and making unauthorised withdrawals from customers' accounts. Yes. Uh, so in your statement, you deal with the conduct of four financial advisors. Yes. And one of those is a financial advisor called Bradley Main. Yes. And Mr Main commenced with NAB in December 2014 as an associate? Yes. Uh, what, what is an associate, Mr Hagger? Uh, he began uh, in a business banking division, so he wasn't an advisor at that time. He was uh, part of our banking staff. What role did he have as a, in the business banking area? Uh, I think he was an associate, so he was inside um, business banking centres serving business bank uh, customers, and there's uh, naturally a, a hierarchy uh, of service within uh, business banking, and uh, an associate uh, level is a, is a reasonable level, but it's, there are more senior business bankers uh, than, than Mr Main was. What would his responsibilities have been in that position as an associate? Uh, he would have assisted the, uh, the business bankers in uh, serving the business bank uh, customers in that region, typically entrepreneurs, small and medium enterprises. Uh, so having commenced in December 2014 as an associate, in February 2016, Mr Main became a financial advisor with NAB? Yes, yes. And is it common for NAB employees to move from being something like an associate to being a financial advisor? Uh, I don't know the numbers, Ms. Orr, but it's one of the career paths that um, bank staff uh, members can take. And did Mr. Main complete any additional training before he commenced as a financial advisor? Uh, yes, he, he completed the training required um, to become uh, an advisor and be issued with a letter of authority. All right. Now, I want to ask you some questions about Mr Main's interactions with two customers, a married couple... Yes. Uh, ..who had previously been customers of another NAB advisor... ..and yes. who Mr Main met with on the 7th of September 2016. Yes, and I'm right, Ms Orr, that those customers' names are redacted. Is they that are. correct? Yes. They are, Mr Thank Hager. You. I won't refer to them. Thank you. Um, uh, could I ask you to turn to... Exhibit 32 of your statement dealing with Mr Main. 
that document is uh, NAB 08001655587. Yes. We'll just have that brought up on the screen, Mr Hagger. Have you seen this document? It's next to your statement. I uh, yes, assume I have. you've read it and you're familiar with it, yes, Mr. Hagger. Um, and it's a document that was prepared by Mr. Main uh, on the 24th of November 2016. Yes. And we see from this first page that it sets out Mr. Main's recollection of the events that took place in relation to his provision of financial advice to the husband and wife I referred to. Yes. Uh, and at 5588, we see Mr Main's account of the first appointment meeting with this couple on the 7th of September 2016. Yes. And Ms Orr, am I right that the location is not redacted? Is that the correct? The location is not redacted. That's yes, thank correct, you. Mr Hagger. We have that on the screen now. Uh, and we can see from this document on this page that uh, the couple discussed with Mr Main their reasons for seeking financial advice. Uh, yes. And they identified that wanting to make sure their money would last through to retirement was a core goal for them. Do you see that in the second paragraph down? Yes. Uh, and at 5589, the following page, We see down the bottom of the page there that the customers agreed that one of the things that Mr May <coughs> would provide them with advice about was reviewing their superannuation. Yes. Uh, and another thing that he would provide them with advice about was changing their existing life insurance cover with MLC and having them fund some of that cover from superannuation accounts. Yes. And over the page at 5590, we see that Mr Main met with the clients again on the 26th of October 2016. Uh, yes. Uh, and this was described by Mr Main in this document as a statement of advice presentation meeting. Yes. And we see from this document that Mr Main proceeded to present the statement of advice in this meeting and that one of the recommendations that he made in the statement of advice was for the customers to reduce their level of life insurance cover with MLC to $200,000 and switch to paying the premiums for that cover through their super. Yes. Uh, at 5591, we see that the customers completed an authority to proceed. Yes. And we also see on that page that um, in relation to insurance, um, although the customers, I'll just find the reference um, for this for you, Mr Hagger, it's the paragraph under the dot points, it's the final dot point. Although the customers were not applying for new insurance because we were changing the payment method to external rollover from their existing funds, we had to complete application forms, excluding the personal statement. Yes, I see that. And can I take you to the application forms completed by uh, these clients? The first is NAB 08001656432. <coughs> Ms. Or, do you know the tab? Oh, we don't have the tab. Uh, that's not in my witness statement, is it? It's not in your witness statement, mm. um, but I think we'll have, I think your counsel will hand to you a hard copy. I understand you, you prefer to use a hard yes, copy. Yes, I do, please. Um, I think they've got one. Thank you. So we see that this is the application form completed by the husband. Uh, I'll let you look through that, but I want to take you to 5672. I think you should yes. have there, Mr Hagger, an unredacted 
uh, version of this document, but on the screen uh, the document will be partially redacted. We see there the reference on that page uh, to um, life insurance cover decreasing to $200,000. Yes. And an existing MLC insurance policy being replaced with a new MLC insurance superannuation policy. Yes. Now, could I ask that you turn to 5657 in this document, which is a page headed Section 6 beneficiary information? Yes. Now, the beneficiary is the person who receives the benefit of the life insurance policy if the insured person dies? Uh, yes, it's yes. binding upon the trustee if it's um, a binding beneficiary nomination. Yes, we'll come to the different um, types of nominations. Uh, if we turn to 5658, we see a page headed beneficiary information continued, and there there are two options uh, for, I'm sorry, we still don't, we, there we have it, 5658, two options for a nomination of beneficiary um, must be nominated by the life to be insured. Uh, the two options, one of which needs to be ticked, are a non-binding death benefit nomination and a non-lapsing binding death benefit nomination. Yes. And here we see that the husband has ticked the box for non-lapsing binding death benefit nomination. Yes. What's the difference between these two death benefit nominations, Mr Hagger? Uh, the difference is really spelled out in the first sentence to each description there. So for a non-binding death uh, benefit nomination, the trustee uh, is aware of the preference of the um, insured. Um, but makes the ultimate decision about uh, where the benefits uh, will go and in what proportions, and there's certain processes around that. Uh, in a non-lapsing binding death benefit nomination, a, uh, th this is binding upon the trustee, so it says to the trustee, this is where you must pay in the event of death and, and the claim mm -hmm. uh, coming through to super. So the insured person nominates a beneficiary Yes. And if they tick the box for non-binding death benefit nomination, yes. um, their nomination is taken into account but is not binding on the trustee. Correct. And if they tick the box non-lapsing binding death benefit nomination, um, their nomination of the beneficiary binds the trustee. Yes. Now, you can see in the box underneath that's been redacted for name and address of beneficiary, um, that uh, the wife's details are um, listed uh, for the beneficiary of the husband's life insurance policy. Yes, I can. And over to the right, you can see that there's a space for portion of total benefit, a percentage yes. is to be provided. Yes. And it's blank. Yes. And at, if we could have the next page brought on the screen next to this, five, uh, 659, we see that the next page is the signing page. Yes. I, I see that here, but I understand it's not on the screen yet. Not quite. And we see there at the top of the page, application agreement and declaration. This is required when making a non-lapsing binding beneficiary nomination. Yes. Uh, and we see that the husband has signed there as the life to be insured. Yes. And we also see witness declaration, only required when making a non-lapsing binding death benefit nomination, must be signed and dated by two adult witnesses. Yes. So uh, the husband um, had made a non-lapsing binding death benefit nomination um, so there was a need for his signature to be witnessed by two adult witnesses um, who made the declaration that follows there, the declaration that they're over 18 years of age, they're not a nominated beneficiary of the life to be insured, and that they've signed and dated 
um, it was signed and dated by the life to be insured in their presence. Yes. Um, and we can see there that the first witness to the husband's signature is Mr. Main, the financial yes. advisor. Yes. And the information for the second witness is redacted, but you can see uh, the name of the second witness. And can you see that that person is a customer service officer who worked with Mr. Main? Yes. Okay. Now, um, could I tender that document, Commissioner? Uh, MLC application form NAB 08001656643 uh, will be exhibit 2.180. And could I show you the equivalent form completed by the wife, which is NAB 08001656603? Uh, do I have a copy of that document, please? Thank you. So um, you can see that this is the wife's application form, and yes. it's 5618. If we could have 5618 and 5619 on the screen. Yes. You can see that the wife has also made a non-lapsing binding death benefit nomination and has nominated the husband as the beneficiary. Yes. And again, the portion of the total benefit is left blank. Yes. And you can see that the wife has signed the document. Yes. Uh, and there is again, as we'll have it on the screen in a minute, um, a signature from the first witness being Mr. Main, the financial advisor. Yes. And the customer service officer um, is listed as the second witness. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. MLC application form uh, NAB 08001656603, exhibit 2.181. And could we return to Mr. Main's um, account of events in the document that you've annexed at tab 32 to your statement at NAB 08001655591? Yes. Uh, and I had read to you um, from the part about needing to complete application forms, the final dot point on that page. Yes. Just wait for the oh, document sorry. to come up onto the screen. I'm sorry, Mr. Hagger. We see that um, Mr. Main goes on to say in that dot point, we discussed the nominations briefly. Both husband and wife wanted each other to be the sole beneficiary via non-lapsing binding nomination. I also signed the witness spot during the meeting to these nominations. At the time of completing these forms, I did not remember that I needed a second person to witness the nominations. I also did not realise that the customers had missed the actual percentage they wanted to nominate going to each other. And we see Mr Main uh, in this document describes in the bottom paragraph um, driving back to Charlestown after the meeting and beginning to process the documentation, uploading it to the CSO pool to be sent to X-Plan. I cannot remember when it was brought to my attention, I missed the second witness signature. Custom client service officer was the one who brought it to my attention and I asked her to witness, which she did. She also brought to my attention that the clients had missed the percentage in relation to their nominations. I recalled that the clients did want each other as their sole benef beneficiaries. I said I would confirm with them again. I completed the percentage signifying the benefits were solely to go to the husband or the wife and vice versa, I used their initials. The documents were taken and resubmitted to MLC. I knew at the time what I had done was wrong. Although from prior conversations I knew how the couple wanted their money delegated and from them putting each other solely on the form, it was a mistake to complete an initial on their behalf. It was also a mistake to have the client service officer witnessed their signatures knowing that she was not present for the meeting. Now, um, could
could I take you, uh, Mr Hager, to the initialed beneficiary forms, which are NAB 0800165569. Again, we have redactions in the document, Mr Hagger, but you can see that this is the same part of the husband's form that we saw earlier, where the husband had nominated the wife as his beneficiary. Yes. But now the percentage figure has been filled in and the amount has been initialed. Yes. But you can see that um, it is the wife's initials that appear on this form, which should have been initialed by the husband. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. MLC application form as amended, NAB 08001655569, Exhibit 2.182. And at 5679, which I think you also have there, Mr Hager, this is the same part of the wife's form that we saw earlier, where the wife nominates the husband as her beneficiary. But again, the percentage <coughs> figure has now been filled in and the amount has been initialed. Yes. But again, it's the husband's initials that appear on this form, which should have been initialed by the wife, as it was the wife's form. Yes, if I can just be a little pedantic for a moment, uh, Mazor. Actually, the initials weren't needed on either form if it was filled out validly by the person who was meant to be filling it out. Of course, of course. So what this advisor has done is enter these um, total benefit amounts later. Yes and decided to initial that change, yes. but made the mistake of using the wrong initials in yes. each form. Yes. Um, so in both cases, the initials were not put there by the customers, nor was the total benefit put there by the customers. It was put there by Mr Main. Yes. What, uh, I tender that document. MLC application form as amended, NAB 08001656789, exhibit 2.183. What are the potential consequences for a client uh, of a failure by their financial advisor to comply with the witnessing requirements for a non-lapsing binding death nomination? It creates the potential for the uh, beneficiary nomination form to be invalid and for the trustee uh, to then uh, make a determination um, in the event of death and in doing so, there is then the possibility that the trustee would allocate the funds differently to the initial wishes uh, expressed by uh, the client. So uh, this conduct had the potential to affect these clients' estate planning wishes? Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I see the time. Uh, I, I won't finish Mr Hagger today. Um, if that's a convenient time, I could continue tomorrow morning. Yes. Can I ask you, Mr Hagger, if you'd be good enough to be back here in time to kick off at 9.45 tomorrow yes, morning? Yes, Commissioner. Yes. 9.45 tomorrow. Mr Hagger, Ms. I had asked you some questions yesterday about the conduct of Mr Main, yes. one of your financial advisors, in October 2016. Yes. And I had tendered uh, application forms uh, completed by Mr Main, uh, and we had been through the process by which um, you acknowledged that Mr Main uh, had not uh, completed those forms in accordance with the requirements of the forms. Yes. Uh, and he had witnessed the client's signatures himself, but had not had a second person present to witness the client's signature at the same time. Correct. Uh, and you gave evidence at the end of yesterday about the potential impact of that conduct on the clients. Yes. And the potential impact of that conduct on whether the trustee uh, would give effect to their estate planning wishes. Yes. Now, that conduct occurred in October 2016. Yes. And on the 22nd of November 2016, 
Ms Mel Lawson, a regional wealth executive, conducted a routine compliance check of Mr Main's files? Yes. And Ms Lawson uh, noticed the irregularity with the initialing on the forms? Yes. Uh, and by that irregularity, I mean that she noticed that the husband's form nominating his wife uh, as the beneficiary had been initialed by the wife rather than the husband. Yes. And the opposite had happened with the other form. Yes. And Ms Lawson raised those concerns with Mr Main. Yes. And he admitted to initialling the forms and asking his customer service officer uh, to witness the forms even though she wasn't present when the clients had signed. Yes. And later that day, uh, Ms Lawson sent Mr Main a letter. Yes. And you've annexed that letter to your witness statement. It's Exhibit 31, NAB 080-016-5585. And if we could have 5585 and 5586 on the screen together, we'll have the entirety of the letter. Could we have 5586? Five, five, Thank you. We see that the clients' names are redacted in this letter on the screen. Mr Hagger? Yes. And we can see from the first page of the letter, while the second page is coming up, that the letter sets out a series of allegations directed to Mr Main. Yes. Uh, and seeks a response from Mr Main. Yes. And at 5586 five, on the second page, we see at the top that Ms Lawson says to Mr Main, as you are aware, NAB is conducting further investigation in relation to inappropriate conduct on this client file. While this investigation is being completed, you are not required to attend work. You will remain on full pay during this time and are to be available to attend the workplace as requested during normal working hours. Yes. And you are advised that whilst you are suspended, you are not to conduct any work for NAB and to, are not to make contact with NAB customers or employees. Yes. And two days later, on the 24th of November 2016, Mr Main provided a written response to this letter. Uh, yes, he did. I think that's what we That's right. The written response night. is the document that I've already taken you to, uh, yes. giving his account of these two meetings with the clients and his conduct in connection with those two meetings. Yes. And then having received that response on the 1st of December 2016, NAB terminated Mr Main's employment. Yes. Uh, could I ask you to look at Exhibit 33 in your witness statement, NAB 080-016-5593. This is the termination letter, Mr Hagger. And again, if we could have both pages, 5593 and 5594 on the screen. You see there, Mr Hagger, that there's reference to a meeting with Mr Main on the 22nd of November and the subsequent letter. Yes. Uh, and um, Ms Lawson tells Mr Main that having considered all the relevant information, including his written response, she's satisfied that he failed to have two non-lapsing binding death benefit nomination forms correctly witnessed for the clients. Yes. And that in order to rectify his error, he requested a colleague to sign as the second witness despite acknowledging that the colleague was not present at the meeting with those clients. Yes. And Ms Lawson says to Mr Main, you deliberately falsified details on the above forms at a later date and submitted the forms to MLC for processing on 9 November 2016. Specifically, you amended the portion of total benefit percentage fields on both forms for the above clients. These amendments were made without the client's knowledge or consent. That's all correct? Yes. Further, you forged the client's initials in a deliberate attempt to falsely represent that the clients had considered and, and approved the amendments. Yes. Um, now, uh, Ms Lawson goes on to say to Mr Main at the bottom of that page, your actions have breached NAB's code of conduct 
personal conduct, honesty and integrity and complying with legal and regu regulatory obligations, voluntary commitments and internal standards and the licensee standards. In addition, they have placed our clients at significant financial risk and have placed NAB, NAB at financial and reputational risk. Yes. And accordingly, um, Mr Main's employment with NAB is terminated with immediate effect. This decision has been made given the seriousness of his conduct. Yes. Do you know, Mr Hagger, if Mr Main was a member of a professional association such as the Financial Planning Association of Australia or the Association of Financial Advisors? Uh, I understand he joined the FPA. I think it was after the um, behaviour that we've just uh, discussed that led to his termination, but it was uh, between then and the 1st of December. I don't know the exact date, Ms. Earl, but I think it was during November. So whilst he was still employed with NAB? Yes. And so did NAB report Mr Main's conduct to the FPA? Uh, no, we didn't. Why not? Uh, because, uh, well, I could give you a long answer to that, but I think the short, which I can if you like, but the short answer to that is that our focus was on the employment disciplinary uh, uh, procedure, which of course uh, led to his termination. The, the longer answer, Ms. Orr, goes into, if you like, the three limbs of discipline. There's the employment discipline, which is something that we carry out. There's the regulatory discipline, which is something that ASIC carries out. And then there's, um, if you like, professional association discipline. And uh, I think you're meeting the uh, CEO of the FBA later today, if, or, or perhaps tomorrow. Uh, and we've been in discussions with the FPA recently to say that uh, we will in future report uh, compliance cases to them. Um, but there is a long history uh, in terms of uh, the FPA. You might be aware, Professor Kingsford Smith, the independent customer advocate for wealth at NAB, uh, was the chair of the FPA um, determination panel through the storm financial situation. So this is the sort of discussion I've had with uh, Professor Kingsford Smith, trying to understand more how the FPA would be of uh, benefit in a situation like this. But the two key uh, uh, areas are the employment discipline and the regulatory discipline. Why is the professional association discipline not a key area as well, Mr Hagger? Well, I think because uh, the the employment discipline, of course, is the most important uh, one because during that period uh, we have the ability through the disciplinary conversations to get to the bottom of what has happened, uh, as is evident, I think, in all four uh, case studies uh, that, uh, that the Commission chose. And then uh, that leads to a decision of disciplinary action. The regulator then, uh, if it's uh, a case that's, uh, uh, that's uh, relevant to the regulator and the regulator chooses to, for example, ban an advisor or take other regulatory action, that's, that's a kind of punishing mechanism. The uh, financial, uh, the FPA or the AFA, any professional body, I'm a member of the Chartered Accountants uh, body, um, professional discipline, it doesn't have the same powers of compulsion uh, the FPA is established, I think, through common law kind of mechanisms. I'm not a lawyer, Mazor, um, but as it's been explained to me, um, there's not the same levels of uh, power in those uh, mechanisms. And of course, uh, the, um, the, the advisor himself or herself can simply choose to exit that association and join another one. We don't have a single body. So I'm... Uh, I've reached the point that I uh, have agreed that we should uh, report cases to the FPA, but I think I'm trying to put in perspective employment discipline, regulatory discipline and financial professional association discipline. They're three separate things. So the FPA has the power, does it not, to expel members from its association? Uh, yes, uh, but then they can go down the road to another association. Well, what if you contractually require your financial advisors to be members of the FPA? 
uh, yes, well, that would have an impact. Uh, we require our advisors to be a member of a professional association. We don't choose between mm -hmm. uh, the AFA and the FPA. Why is that? Because we think both organisations are valid professional uh, organisations. But is the impact of that that if there is expulsion of a financial advisor by one of those associations, as you've conceded, they can then just become a member of the other association. So why not require them to be a member of a single association? Oh, I see. Well, uh, the, uh, the, the core relationship is between the member and the association itself. So w we have uh, advisors who believe they get a lot of value out of the AFA. We, we have, uh, I think, nearly a thousand uh, members of the FPA. So we, you know, highly value both associations. Do you uh, value the disciplinary processes that they have? Yes, we do. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Kingsford-Smith, I think, played a very important role for Australia through the storm uh, financial situation, working with Matthew Rowe and the FPA team. Uh, Working, working through that matter. But the, the, the point I'm making, Mazor, is um, the, the professional association discipline is really on a different plane to the employment discipline and the um, regulatory discipline. And what I'm putting to you, uh, Mr Hagger, is that it's a very important plane because your internal disciplinary measures relate to whether or not the advisor um, uh, is of uh, satisfactory competence and professionalism to work with you at NAB, and if you decide they're not and you terminate that advisor, uh, they can go off and work for another licensee. And something that would prevent them from doing that is if you have referred their conduct to the FPA and the FPA has expelled them from membership and licensees require members to be uh, employees to be members of that association. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, Ms. Orr. I think the way we have approached that across the industry is really through the uh, ASIC Financial Advisor Register, so that um, where, whereas with at least two professional associations, uh, an advisor could move from one to the other, the, in terms of ASIC's Financial Advisor Register, if ASIC decides to ban an advisor, then that advisor is recorded as such on the register. So that makes a notification to ASIC's ASIC of extreme importance, doesn't it, if that's what you're relying on? Yes, for the, um, for the kind of advisors that ASIC needs to know about, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and just before I leave this topic of the discipline re disciplinary regime, um, why has it taken until now for you to reach a position where you have decided that advisers who've engaged in misconduct will be reported by NAB to the disciplinary body? Uh, well, when you say the disciplinary body, we're in conversations with the FPA and uh, I don't think we're at the same stage yet with the uh, yes. AFA. You mentioned the FPA yes. before. So um, this is... Uh, conversation we have had recently with the FPA. Um, so our focus has been on, number one, the employment discipline, which is something we've been operating for you know, a long period of time, uh, and on regulatory discipline, which has been an evolving process of which advisors to report to ASIC. That's where our focus has been. Uh, now we're uh, also uh, looking at professional association discipline. We're, we're very much open to this, Ms. Orr, but our focus has been on the other two. So I'm just trying to understand why the change, why now you are focusing on the professional associations? Uh, because I think we have reached a stage of evolution with our understanding of ASIC's requirements. The uh, financial uh, advice register is in place. So um, employment discipline is something that is a very mature process for us. We've had this evolving process with uh, ASIC uh, now we're looking at professional associations. All right. Um, does NAB notify ASIC of advisors whose conduct gives rise to uh, compliance concerns or serious compliance concerns? Yes. All right. Could I ask you to look at uh, Exhibit 37 to your statement, which is NAB 005164004? And if we could have triple uh, zero six brought up on the screen with triple zero four. 
you can see from 0004, Mr Hagar, that this is minutes of a meeting of the Breach <coughs> Review Committee on the 25th of January 2017. Yes. And if we could have 0006 on the screen, we can see that one of the agenda items for this meeting uh, was Mr Main's conduct. Yes. Uh, and we see there, uh, starting with Mr Smith, do you see that entry on 0006? Yes. yes. In relation to Mr Main? Yes. Mr Smith updated the committee. Only two incidents have so far been identified. All clients have been passed to new advisers. So that's two incidents of the conduct that we've been discussing involving yes. Mr Main. Yes. Um, so one other person by this time had been found to have been engaging in the same conduct? Uh, yes, you, we covered, well actually we didn't go to the paragraph, but in the attachment uh, yesterday, the meeting, or oh, sorry, the uh, document that Mr Main described, um, his, his behaviour, I think it refers to another uh, Two uh, incidents by Mr Main. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, only two incidents have so far been identified. All clients have been passed to new advisers. No concerns have been found relating to advice issues. Mr Hayworth Booth noted that this advisor does not currently fit the serious compliance concern criteria. Accordingly, he has not as yet been reported to ASIC. The committee discussed the matter and having regard to the lack of fraudulent activity and the appropriate operation of compliance measures on the part of the licensee, determined that the event is not a breach and hence not reportable to ASIC. Yes. So that was the decision made by the Breach Review Committee on the 25th of January 2017. Yes. But NAB had terminated Mr Main's employment on the basis that he had deliberately falsified forms. Yes. Uh, his conduct was also misconduct that resulted in immediate termination. Yes. Uh, so Mr Main's conduct, I want to put to you, did meet the criteria for serious compliance concerns on the basis that he'd engaged in dishonest misconduct, on the basis that he'd engaged in deceptive misconduct, and on the basis that he'd engaged in misconduct that would result in immediate termination. Yes. Um, so why didn't this committee decide to notify ASIC that Mr Main's conduct constituted a serious compliance concern? Uh, well, at that time, uh, Mr Haworth uh, Booth did not believe it met the criteria. Uh, ultimately, we believe it did meet the criteria uh, and we reported Mr Main. Was Mr Hayworth Booth correct in his assessment that it did not meet the criteria? No, not in my view. I've, I've told him that. I uh, have discussed this with him. I understand where his point of view was coming from uh, because uh, he, in, in these uh, cases, the forms were then dealt to, so there was no client um, exposure going forward. And his view was that the advisor um, had, uh, had not uh, provided inappropriate uh, advice and he was seeing the serious compliance criteria um, <coughs> definition through that zone. But to cut things short, Ms. Orr, I think he was wrong and we reported uh, him to, we reported Mr Main to ASIC. So you accept, particularly given what you've said about the importance of that second disciplinary framework, the regulatory framework, you accept that NAB ought to have reported uh, Mr Main's conduct to ASIC at this time but did not? Uh, yes, that, that is correct. If, if I can be precise for a moment. Yes. Um, there are two forms of reporting to ASIC. One is a section 912 RD, which, uh, as you're aware, and we may get to, we um, uh, issued later, and then there is this voluntary reporting to ASIC, uh, which, as I say, has been an evolving process. So during this period, there was some confusion during those uh, months, but we ironed out that confusion with ASIC, and uh, we um, then reported uh, Mr Main. Do you mean confusion on the part of NAB, not on the part of ASIC? Uh, well, as I say, it's been an evolving process, so probably uh, it, it actually began with a letter I wrote, Mr Medcraft, back in February 2015, and then we went through a period, Ms Orr, where we would notify ASIC uh, when advisors of concern departed. Uh, but then uh, ASIC 
didn't need to know about all advisers, they said, but what they wanted to know about, which is what they clarified in a meeting with me on the 1st of May, was that they wanted to know about misconduct uh, situations and so we adjusted our processes accordingly and Mr Main was uh, reported through. But Mr Main fell through the cracks at this time. He ought to have been reported at this time. Yes, no, I, yeah. I, knowing what I know now and, and really knowing what I knew on the 1st of May from ASIC, um, he, he should have been reported at that time. Thank you. Could I ask you to look then at Exhibit 43 to your statement, Mr Hagger, which is NAB 020009-9493? Yes. You can see from this document that this is four months later, uh, in May 2017. Yes. And Mr Tim Steele, uh, the general manager of NAB Financial Planning uh, prepares a memo to the Breach Review Committee. Yes. And at 9494, over the page, we see that Mr Steele provides an explanation of how this event was discovered. Yes. Uh, and on that same page, Mr Steele notes that over February and March 2017, this is towards the bottom of the page, NAB identified a number of other instances of employees incorrectly witnessing <coughs> beneficiary nomination forms. Yes. Uh, so three events in February and six further events in March. Yes. And then we see at 9495 that in April 2017, a further eight events were identified by our advisor self-reporting to their regional wealth exec executive. Yes. Uh, and at um, 9495 to 9496, if we could have both of those pages on the screen, we see what Mr Steele describes as the details of the event under the heading event details. Yes. Um, do you see there towards the bottom of the page that Mr Steele records that common statements made by employees who have been interviewed about engaging in the invalid witnessing of binding nomina nomination documents are that, first, they understood that they were not following the instructions as set out on the application form, but they believed that this was common practice and was acceptable? Yes. Second, they had experienced this as common practice when working for previous non-NAB licensees. Yes. And third, the rationale for engaging in this practice was for the convenience of the client and to help carry out the client's instructions quickly, particularly where client appointments were held outside of the office with no second witness available during the appointment. There was no intent to cause harm to the client. Yes. Fourth, they did not understand the seriousness of their actions, particularly given that at least one person had followed correct procedure and witnessed the client's signature, and that in many cases the second witness knew the client and was familiar with the client's file records. Yes. And finally, they did not appreciate that their actions could affect the validity of the nomination or the effect this could have on the client's estate planning wishes. Yes. Um, so we see there that having now discovered that this was not an issue that was restricted to Mr Main, yes. more and more people were being identified as also engaging in this practice. Yes. NAB's employees who were engaging in this practice um, are telling NAB that they regard this as common practice. Yes. Um, does it concern you that NAB employees believed it was common practice to sign a document indicating that they'd witnessed a signature when in fact they hadn't? Yes, it concerned me very much. And if this was the common practice, what does it say, Mr Hagger, about the ethical standards of NAB employees? Uh, well, I think it says that, uh, I won't sort of, I think your question goes across all employees. Um, I won't bring all employees into this, but I think what it says is that in relation to uh, the financial uh, advice area, there was a failure of discipline. And uh, that's what I told the board. And uh, behind this, I think you, your question goes squarely to ethics. Mm. And uh, I was reading last week the book of Dennis Gentleman, who's um, a writer on ethics and a former NAB employee, and he talks about social norms. 
and I, from all my interaction with this particular issue, I believe that uh, the uh, client service uh, officers and the advisors uh, concerned thought they were taking a shortcut in the interests of the client, and yet it's very stark on the form that you either witness the form when you're present or you don't. So uh, I think a social norm had crept in and become entrenched. We know that now. We didn't know that back in November 2016, but this is the sort of thing I want to see. We could have closed the books on this case study in December by terminating the advisor. We did get the forms re-signed. We could have stopped there, but we investigated further. We began to uh, realise that it was more common and then we acted upon that because we want to do the right thing by customers and as we mentioned last night, this is very important. You described it in that answer, um, Mr Hager, as a failure of discipline. Yes. I want to put to you that it's more than that. Um, it's a failure of culture at NAB uh, and it's a failure of education of NAB's advisors and client service officers. If I can just break that down, um, you've said three things. The first one you said is a failure of discipline, I agree. The second one you said is it's a cultural matter and I agree, I said exactly those words to um, the Board Risk Committee on the 7th of June. And the third one you said was it's a matter of education. Our view was, well it actually says on the form quite squarely mm -hmm. that the forms are to be witnessed uh, in the presence of the client. And uh, so the fact that they, that wasn't happening, you, you don't normally believe that you need to do training for something that's very self-evident on the form. Be that as it may, um, there, there is no doubt across our network today from all the consequences that have occurred from this that forms are there for a reason. Signatures are incredibly important and we need to express uh, uh, in all our actions, our clients' wishes. I want to put to you, um, Mr Hager, that what you've just said about it being very clear from the form what was required yes. by the advisers makes their conduct even more serious because the uh, advisers and the client service officers um, were circumventing the requirement that was plain on the face of the form for the benefit of the client. Yes. Yes, I, I'm not walking away from the seriousness of, of this at all, uh, Ms Orr. And in fact, we have uh, gone out to our clients and said, can you please have these forms re-witnessed? And uh, that's obviously occurred on a large scale. We may get to that. Um, our staff were, uh, I think the final dot point here is the key one. It says, um, they did not appreciate their actions could affect the validity of the nomination. We took that as no uh, excuse. Um, there were consequences uh, and the lesson has been learned. Is that a failure of education though amongst your advisers, um, Mr Hager, that they didn't appreciate that this conduct could affect the validity of the client's nominations? Well, as I say, we have uh, now adopted education but we didn't think it was necessary because I think as you pointed out last night, the, the form is straightforward. Were you concerned that what your um, people were telling you was that they didn't understand the seriousness of their actions? Uh, well, I was concerned about the entire matter. In terms of, uh, so I think yesterday we didn't have the suburb redacted, did we? So no, this we particular didn't. situation occurred in Musselbrook. Musselbrook's a town with I think something like 12,000 people in Australia. Mr Main has gone out and met with uh, the, the client in Musselbrook. Uh, and then he's got back to his office 130 kilometres away. And he's a new advisor, as we discussed yesterday. And he's realised he hasn't got uh, the second signature. What he should have done is gone back to Musselbrook or posted the client or there's, there's a number of actions he could have taken at that moment and he didn't and that concerns me. But you know, Mr Hager, that this wasn't restricted to Mr Main in Musselbrook. Um, no. By this point, it had, been, it had become clear to NAB that this was yes. a more widespread spread practice. Yes. Okay. Um, do you think that NAB employees at this time had an adequate understanding of their ethical and legal obligations? 
Yes. And they did this despite that adequate understanding yes. of their legal and ethical obligations. Yes. Does that concern you, that if they knew yes. that this was wrong legally and ethically, they went ahead and did it anyway? Yes, they didn't have a full understanding of the... Le As I say, I've spoken to a number of uh, people involved. They, they didn't know. It was, you know, sloppy, unprofessional. And uh, it, I, I'm saying they didn't have full understanding, but the forms are very clear and we have no tolerance for forms not being followed. It's, uh, uh, it's very important. Forms are all there for a reason. Bank processes are there for a reason and they're there to help customers and protect customers. Mm -hmm. Could I ask you to look at a document, uh, Mr Hager, which is NAB 0052170360. It's not annexed to your statement, but um, I'm sure a copy will be provided to you. You can see the opening page on the screen there. So this is uh, a report dated the 27th of November 2015. Yes. Uh, and this was a report that NAB received at that time following a review that it had commissioned into conflicts of interest within 360 Research and between 360 Research and its internal stakeholders? Uh, yes, I see that. And can you explain what 360 Research is? Uh, 360 Research is a part of the National Australia Bank Group which uh, does research into products. And in the course of conducting this review into the relationship between NAB, uh, its aligned licensees and 360, the reviewer looked into the culture of each of those organisations? Uh, I have read this report, so uh, yes, but I've only read it in the last <laughs> few days. Yes, well, could I direct you to a particular part of it at 0367? Yes. Um, do you see there that the reviewer made some findings under the line typical interviewee response? And can I ask you to look to the third sentence in that paragraph? There was an absence of contextually tailored training in conflicts of interest, the code of conduct or expected standards of behaviours. The research recorded little specific knowledge of these essential protocols. There is a prevailing assumption that employees are driven by their own sense of what is right and wrong, rather than being guided by how the organisation has defined appropriate conduct. There is widespread absence of knowledge of the code of conduct and expected behaviour standards. And further down, the research identified that raising issues of concern about advisors was seen as risky because they may be seen as valuable to the firm. Interviewees said they had rarely seen anyone fired for breach of ethical standards or a department sanctioned where poor behaviour had been exposed. This lack of visibility about personal consequences inhibits, removes an, an effective risk deterrent. Now, this was less than a year before um, Mr Main's uh, uh, false witnessing of um, the binding nomination forms was uncovered. Yes. Um, was Mr Main's case and the other cases of false witnessing that you subsequently discovered caused by NAB's failure to ensure that its employees understood their ethical obligations? No, I don't think so. What do you say to these findings of your external researcher in this document, uh, Mr Hagger? Uh, I, well, uh, firstly, um, I understand this report uh, interviewed 21 uh, staff members of NAB. Uh, so uh, having had a look at this report last week, that was the first time I had seen this report, Mazor. I see. This was commissioned by the Chief Risk uh, yes. Officer for his purposes, uh, which, which I admire. It's, he's an independent uh, operative inside NAB. So... Uh, the Chief Risk Officer didn't share these results with you, Mr Hagger? No, he didn't. Um, would you have appreciated receiving the results of this research? Uh, yes, I would. I've spoken to him about that, but it's up to he's, he's independent. Uh, he commissioned this report for his own uh, insights. He then, with those insights, was uh, th that assisted his commentary on a range of reports, uh, which uh, 
uh, I produced and others uh, produced during the period. And uh, he has high regard. I haven't met Dr. Uh, Attractor Lagan. I'm not even sure how to, how to pronounce um, the doctor's name. Um, but uh, your question gets to, um, I think, uh, does this have specific relevance to Mr Main's situation? I'm saying no, because the Mr Main did two things. He uh, initialed a form as if he was the client. Mm -hmm. Well, that crosses a line that all advisors mm -hmm. know about and uh, led to his termination. And he said in his own uh, statement that he knew it was a mistake when he did it. Uh, and I want to bring this back not just to Mr Main, Mr Hagger, I mm -hmm. want to bring it back to the fact that multiple employees were engaging in this practice and were describing it. Not, not in uh, initialing um, as if they are the client, but uh, I assume you're referring to the witnessing. The yes. witnessing practice, yes. which had the potential to invalidate um, yes. the nomination. Yes. Um, so they were telling NAB that they were doing that and that it was common practice and they didn't understand the seriousness of the consequences of yes, that. Yes, that's what they were saying. And I'm asking you to consider um, those events in light of these findings a short time before within NAB. Uh, yes, and I'm saying uh, from <laughs> our perspective, we had to uh, make our view on what had led to this situation and what a proportionate response would be. Mm -hmm. And uh, the decision that we made was that the forms are straightforward. And if you witness something saying you're there when you're not, then you have done the wrong thing. I tender this document, Commissioner. Exhibit 2.184 will be Managing Values Report 27 November 2015, NAB 00521700360. Could I, I take you back to Mr Steele's memorandum? Before we... Yes. Apart from this report, while it remains on the screen, uh, can I just explore a moment with you, Mr Hagger, uh, some more general points that might be raised by it. There seems to be a contrast drawn in the paragraph we see on the screen under self-interest enabled by inadequate face-to-face -face training. There seems to be a contrast drawn between an organisation depending on individual employees' moral compasses and showing uh, individual employees how the moral compass is to be applied in commonly encountered circumstances. First, do you accept that there is a distinction of that kind being... He made here, yes, Commissioner, I accept that. And, uh, just to follow it out a bit further, in understanding the culture of an organisation, is it relevant to know whether the organisation positively shows its employees how commonly accepted moral standards apply and are to be given effect in commonly encountered circumstances? Yes, I, th I believe it is, Commissioner. Is that particularly relevant uh, in circumstances where the employees uh, are engaged to give advice to third parties? Yes. Not least because of the uh, issue of conflicts of interest? Yes but also uh, in connection with the giving of advice to take important uh, financial and legal steps uh, directed towards future economic well-being. Yes. I was struck by your answer that the CRO did not share uh, what this report revealed. Do I understand that to be the case? Uh, well, just a couple of clarifying comments, uh, Commissioner, uh, that may help. Firstly, the CRO didn't share the report with me. He did share it with the Advice and Licences Board 
and with the financial advisor team. So sometimes uh, remembering my role uh, inside the bank you know, covers a broader gambit. You don't see every bit of paper. So I don't see every bit of paper. In the bank, you astonish uh, me. I, <laughs> yeah. But I was surprised he didn't share this uh, with me. I asked him about it because we talk maybe three times a week, uh, the, the CRO uh, and myself, and um, he has enormous influence inside the bank, as he should. Uh, his answer to me was that actually this helped him keep watch of the progress that we were making uh, in um, our cultural development from being a, an advisor-centric culture to a customer-centric culture. This, the um, second clarification I would make, Commissioner, is that we give very substantial training and guidance to advisors, uh, backed up by compliance and checklists and all sorts of things, for the key areas uh, of an advisor carrying out his or her work. It had not occurred to us that this sort of practice of witnessing would be going on. So we did not have it in our checklists, we did not have it in our training because we believed on the face of it, the document is clear in what it's asking for and should be carried out professionally. Implicit in that answer seems to me to be a proposition that you didn't tell advisors, look, forms matter. Yes. Follow them. Yes. Simple advice like that, not given, apparently. Is that right? Uh, well, it's certainly uh, advice given now, uh, and that's not just in advice, it's uh, across, the, uh, across the bank. And uh, I think in, in terms of uh, forms, I, I think the bank believes it has been clear. And I believe the bank has been clear. But on this specific practice, we had not given specific training to advisors um, about the filling in of this form. And actually, these forms don't even need to be signed by advisors. They just need to be signed by two adults. So it had not occurred to us that this would not be um, carried out until the main situation uh, occurred. We had a, a sort of, a, we had a first signal of it in the Thomas case, uh, which uh, in, in relation to a different advisor, but um, this was the, this was a clear signal to us that we needed to address it and that's why we did commission. I just want to make sure that your answer um, to a question of the Commissioner was correctly recorded in the transcript, Mr Hagar. Um, the transcript records you saying, I am not surprised he didn't share this with me. Um, no, sorry. It, I, I, I am I think that is an error. Yes. I just want to make sure that I, the transcript... I was surprised. I, my first reaction was by surprise and admiration, actually. <laughs> I thought, he's independent. He can do this. Um, but... Sorry, I, I meant to say I was surprised. Yes, I think you did. I think the transcript did not pick that up Thank correctly you. and I wanted to make sure we Thank had you, an accurate, accurate account of your evidence, Slight Mr difference. Hagar. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, I said, Mr Hagar, that I uh, wanted to take you back to um, Mr Steele's report, uh, yes. which is tab uh, 43 to your statement, NAB 020-009-9493. Mr Steele's report to the Breach yes. Review Committee in May 2017. Yes. If I could ask you to look at 9496 in that document. We see that by this time, May 2017, um, to date we have identified this issue with 19 practitioners. However, the NAB Financial Planning Network has been given until the 31st of May to self-report and we believe this issue will be widespread. As yes. yet, there is no known client impact. However, if a nomination is found to be invalid, this could impact on the death benefits being distributed in accordance with the client's wishes. So having identified 19 practitioners engaged in this practice, Mr Steele believed that the issue would be widespread? Uh, yes, by this date, yes. And I, I want to suggest to you that um, that doesn't show much faith uh, by Mr Steele. 
uh, in the ethical standards of uh, the NAB practitioners in the financial planning network? Oh, I think uh, it, it best to clarify the, the train uh, of, of, of events. So Mr Main has engaged in this conduct. Yes. Mr Steele then uh, put it up as a case study yes. across the NAB financial planning network. Yes. We then began to find other incidents, but also the sort of chatter in, in uh, Mr um, Steele's uh, surrounds were this is a broader, more entrenched yes. practice. That's what he was we were hearing. being told that this was common practice. Yes, so, uh, so the clarification I'm giving is it's not that he saw 19 and decided he had no faith in everybody else. He saw 19 but was hearing chatter that actually were really all the dot points that you uh, mentioned on the page uh, before. So uh, 19 were saying this is what we all do. So that he realised it was a bigger practice. And the day after this memorandum was created by Mr Steele for the Breach Review Committee, uh, Mr Steele sent an email to all NAB financial planning employees. Yes. And could I uh, take you to that email, which is Exhibit 42, to your statement, NAB 00513705535? Yes. We see there that... Um, to all employees of NAB Financial Planning, um, Mr Steele sent this email, which refers under the heading Next Steps to any NAB Financial Planning staff member who believes they may not have followed the correct process is asked to report this to their people leader by 31 May 2017. Following this, you'll be asked to provide a list of any clients whose forms may not have been correctly completed Anyone on leave will have four weeks upon returning to work to advise their people leader of any such instances. We will then work together to contact relevant clients to ensure their beneficiary nomination forms are completed correctly. Yes, there's, there's two things going on here, Mazur. I think, Commissioner, you raised the point about follow the forms. The first part of this is saying exactly that. This is the process, follow the forms. And then the second part deals with, well, what are we going to do about any forms? that we have doubts about. And Mr Steele goes on to explain on the next page of this email, 0536. Yes. That financial advisors who self-report this conduct will be given an irreversible amber conduct gate. Yes. And support staff who self-report will be given a reversible amber conduct gate. Yes. And we've heard evidence um, previously about NAB's conduct gate system. Yes. Uh, the consequences of an amber conduct gate is that uh, the person is still eligible for their quarterly and annual incentive payments, but they're reduced by 25%. Yes. Now, um, on the 25th of May 2017, two days later, the issue came back before the Breach Review Committee. Uh, yes. And you've annexed the minutes of that meeting as Exhibit 44 to your statement. Uh, yes, I have. NAB 061-005-4830. Yes. And if I could ask you to look at uh, 4832 in that document, which is the discussion of the agenda item relating to invalid binding nomination witnessing. Yes. We'll just wait till that comes on the screen. We have the first page, and now we need 4832. We see that Ms Thompson, who's recorded in the middle of the page as Senior Legal Counsel, advise the committee that any evidence of widespread misconduct on the part of employees may indicate that we should have done more as a licensee. While there is no current evidence as to previous similar events, there appear to be concerns around our compliance procedures in respect of the witnessing process. There may be an impact to members if it can be shown that their intentions were not properly being put into effect. Yes. The committee discussed the binding nature of the nomination forms, the potential consequences of forms not being effective, 
the role of and implications for trustees and the possibility of this issue impacting on other areas of the bank. The committee yes. determined that more information is required before it can make a decision as to whether a breach has occurred and if so, its significance. Yes. So that was the position on the 25th of May. There yes. was a further meeting of the Breach Review Committee on the 31st of May. Uh, yes. And this time the committee decided that the breach was significant. Uh, yes. Um, can I ask you to look at a document which is NAB 061005 and while that document is coming up onto the screen, um, there was a reference by Mr Hagger earlier in his evidence, Commissioner, to a person whose name is the subject of a non-publication direction. Right. Um, I, I apologise, Mr. I can repeat the name again, uh, but that might not be Rather useful. Rather seems to defeat the object, doesn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure, Commissioner, if you otherwise... Uh, will know which part of the evidence. Mr Hagger uh, was talking about the detection of this issue and referred to um, having an earlier indication of an issue of this nature advisor. through another advisor. And so the name of that advisor is the subject of an NPD. Is that right? That is. Well, I draw that to the attention of the media. I'm sorry we should have uh, uh, created this difficulty for you, but uh, there we are. Uh, the name is not to be published. My apologies, Commissioner. Oh, the heck of these things happen. Now, we try not to and they happen. Th this document which we have now, Mr Hagger, is the minutes of the Breach Review Committee meeting on the 31st of May 2017. Yes. And we see at 4861 that there's an update to the committee from Mr Steele. Uh, and we see third paragraph down, the committee discussed the event and having regard to the potential number of clients impacted, the potential for loss to nominated beneficiaries, lack of adequate compliance and control arrangements and the duration of the event, determined that the event is a significant breach by National Australia Bank Limited and hence reportable to ASIC. Yes. Uh, the significant breach notification is also annexed to your statement, but first I tender the minutes of this meeting, Commissioner. Sorry, Ms Orr, minutes of meeting of? 31 May 2017, it's the Breach Review Committee. NAB, NAB 061 that document will become Exhibit 2.185. Now, the breach notification to ASIC uh, is Exhibit 45 to your statement, Mr Hagger, yes. NAB 0050210488. Yes. And we see from that document uh, that on the 15th of June 2017, uh, NAB lodged a significant breach notification with ASIC in relation to the issue of invalid <coughs> binding nomination witnessing. Yes. Uh, the date, if you're looking for it, uh, Mr Hagger, is on uh, 0492. Uh, I, sorry, I knew the date, Ms Orr. I was just taking a sip of water while... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, now, at 0491... We see that by this time in June uh, of 2017, the notification says that NAB has identified 325 staff who were involved in incorrectly witnessing beneficiary nomination forms. Yes. And 204 of them were financial advisors who operated as representatives of NAB. Yes. Were these all NAB employees? Uh, yes. And at 0490, we see the description towards the bottom of the page of why, in NAB's view, the breach is significant. Yes. Uh, and we see there, if we could have this page and the subsequent page on the screen, 
that next to the reference to extent to which breach or likely breach indicates the licensee's compliance arrangements are inadequate, NAB said, this event does raise concerns about the adequacy of the licensee's supervision and monitoring process in relation to the completion of the form. Although the licensee has trained its staff and this type of conduct is difficult to anticipate and detect, the extent of this practice does give rise to the question whether it should have been anticipated and detected earlier. Yes. Now, I, I want to suggest to you that that's quite a narrow understanding of this problem, which indicated a willingness of employees to attest to things that weren't true. Sorry, can you please repeat the question, Ms. Orr? This description of the problem that NAB gave to ASIC reflects, I'm suggesting to you, a narrow understanding of the problem, which we know um, showed a willingness on the part of NAB employees to attest to things that weren't true. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, well, the, uh, everything here is correct. You're saying it's narrow, Ms. Orr, is that what you're saying? Um, well, uh, if that's uh, so, I think it probably needs to be read in the context of the broad document and the discussions we were having with ASIC uh, at that time. Um, our, our discussions with ASIC were uh, aimed to be fulsome on the topic, uh, not, uh, not narrow. NAB identified for ASIC in this document the obligations breached by the licensee. We see that at 0491 to 0492. Yes. Um, do you see right down the bottom of 0491 the heading 2.8, obligation breached by licensee? Yes. And then if we have 0492 there, you'll see that sections of the Corporations Act are listed at the top of the next page. Yes. And those sections are section 1041 capital H of the Corporations Act and that's a provision that prohibits conduct in relation to a financial product or financial service that it's, is misleading or deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive. Yes. Uh, and there was also a reference to a breach of section 912A subsection 1 subparagraph A of the Corporations Act which contains the obligation on a financial services licensee to do all things necessary to ensure that the financial services covered by the licence are provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Yes. So this was conduct that was acknowledged by NAB to be misleading and deceptive or likely to mislead or deceive? Uh, it was... Uh, behaviour which was being acknowledged by NAB at, uh, to be potentially misleading to the um, uh, to the trustee and uh, potentially to have an impact upon clients. Yes, well, NAB chose to identify these sections as obligations breached by the licensee by this conduct. Yes. Um, it was conduct that revealed, didn't it, that NAB had not done all things necessary to ensure that the financial services provided under its licence uh, were provided honestly, efficiently and fairly. I, I think that's what this section is saying. Yes. I think uh, in the discussions as well, um, I think, uh, excuse me if I've got the wrong reference, but I think in Reg Guide 256, it talks about being honest, efficient and fair gets to how you deal with customers once something happens that might impact them. So uh, it was sort of in the fullness of all of that that our, our discussions uh, occurred with ASIC as to what was the right uh, description of the event and the right remediation. All right, uh, Mr Hagger, um, following this uh uh, document this breach report to ASIC, or I should say slightly prior to it, because this document went in on the 15th of June 2017, but on the 5th of June 2017, um, NAB included Mr Main in a list that it gave ASIC about advisers for which it had compliance concerns. Yes. 
Now that was about six months after NAB had terminated Mr Main's employment. Yes. Why did NAB wait so long before telling ASIC that this conduct of Mr Main was a compliance concern? Well, I think that's what we discussed earlier, that for the first three months, there we had some internal confusion about whether this is an advisor to report to ASIC. A wrong judgment was made during that uh, process. We had a meeting with ASIC on the 1st of May where they clarified for us uh, around breach reporting and um, uh, advisor reporting of this nature. And um, that led to the 5th of June um, uh, submission that we made, reporting we made to ASIC. So the right decision, the decision to report this as a compliance concern to ASIC was made in June 2017? Correct. It, and, and was, or it, it should have been made in uh, March or, you know, knowing what we know now, um, it should have been quicker. It's taking about, there's a period of time in the evolution of our um, reporting protocols with ASIC, there's the, the balance to be struck between the timeliness of the report and the information that ASIC wants to see in the report. So there is a period of time. I, I wouldn't uh, want you to think that ASIC expects to, you know, this document on the day after termination um, but they would expect to see it quicker than six months and so they should. What reporting protocols does NAB have with ASIC? We don't have formal reporting protocols. I think uh, that's something that we may um, look to do, but uh, it began, as I say, with my letter to Mr Medcraft of February 2015 saying we wanted to report beyond the 912D report so that they would become aware of more advisors. That was very acceptable to them because they were uh, beginning the financial advisor register at that time. Uh, and since then, as I say, the process has been evolving, but there's no one document that says this is how it works. This is a voluntary reporting uh, mechanism. We want to help ASIC uh, to, because they oversee a system that's uh, clearly very important for all of us. But you're aware of the statutory obligation that NAB has under 912D of the Corporations yes, Act in relation to the reporting of significant breaches? Correct, Ms. Well. And you're aware that there's a 10-day yes. limit for making those reports? Yes, um, that's a 10 business day requirement. Yes. Um, in March of this year, NAB gave ASIC an update about this matter? Uh, yes. And by that time, um, by last month, NAB had identified that 2,520 clients were affected by this issue? Yes. Um, now, that indicates, does it not, that this was not attributable to misconduct by any one individual employee? Yes. Um, you say in your statement that the conduct was attributable to three things. You deal with this in paragraph 30 of your statement. respect of those advisers who engaged in incorrect witnessing of beneficiary nominations in the absence of the nominator, I consider the principal reasons were a belief that the system of policies, processes and controls enforced by NAB are too burdensome, related to A, a lack of care in complying with NAB's internal policies, processes and controls due to indifference or a preference to maintain entrenched behaviours that were not permitted and a desire to complete a process with minimum inconvenience to the advisor and the client, or a desire to engage in a shortcut without questioning why such conduct was impermissible. Yes. And what I want to suggest to you, um, Mr. Hab Mr Hagger, is that each of those reasons that you've given indicate broader failings on the part of NAB. Uh, well, uh Perhaps the, the best way to uh, answer that, Ms. Orr, is to say that in section three, uh, question three from the Commission, I replied narrowly, deliberately, in terms of, as per the paragraph 28, 
as per these other things the employees told us yes. as to why they did it. Yes. Question four is a much broader question. What yes. other things NAB has done? I think it's self-evident uh, that there is a linkage between question three and four, which I acknowledge. And actually, um, you know, this is a customer matter that emerged that demanded action and we've taken actions and a number of those are in uh, section four. And in fact, section four is quite expansive of the number of things that uh, I've instigated uh, in the financial advice space to uh, improve processes and controls over recent years, including addressing this matter. And I want to put to you that implicit in the fact that you've taken that action, which you've dealt with in response to question four in your witness statement, is an acceptance by NAB of the broader failings on the part of NAB that led to this conduct. Oh, I see what you say. Well, I, I know we're sort of um, circling a, an issue here where I'm saying the forms were self-evident. And so from the bank's perspective, it's very clear and I think would be clear to you know, anyone reading that form that you must witness a form uh, appropriately. I think what uh, you're asking me is, well, does NAB have any role in the fact that, it, that this behaviour uh, occurred? And I think by us um, um, issuing a breach notice according to 912D, that NAB has said, yes, there are uh, there are failings from a NAB viewpoint, which we will address, uh, which we have. What has NAB done to ensure that none of the 2,520 affected customers suffered any detriment as a result of this conduct? Well, that's been our prime focus through this period. So, uh, several things, Ms. Well. Firstly, we had to work through, well, how many customers are potentially impacted yes. uh, by this? Uh, and that's why we went through the process in May which saw the increase in customer numbers through what was effectively, uh, you could call it an amnesty uh, period from a termination perspective, notwithstanding there were consequences, but we were bringing to the surface because we wanted every customer to have peace of mind about their estate planning wishes. So having then um, defined the set of customers where we had doubts, not certainty, but doubts about the validity of the forms, we then uh, wrote to those uh, customers uh, the 2,520. I think there were 30 that we've had difficulty uh, contacting, but the rest we've reached contact with. Those customers have been fantastic. They have uh, ad addressed the issues uh, in the vast majority of cases by simply re-signing the forms uh, with valid witnesses and sending them uh, back to us. Uh, as things stand today, there are, I think, 250 customers who have not yet uh, return those forms. Over time, we think that will whittle down to uh, a much smaller number again. So that's the first thing we've done, writing to customers and, and, uh, and you've seen the documents on that. The second um, uh, thing that we've done is had discussions with the trustee. Now, there were actually 27 or 28 trustees, different trustees involved in the 2,520 customers, you know, they all weren't all with one fund. Mm. In all but one of those cases, we have received all the forms back. So we're now down to just one trustee in relation to the outstanding forms. The outstanding trustee is Newless, which uh, is a NAB, um, part of the NAB group. It uh, oversees the MLC super fund. And so, uh, NAB Financial Planning has issued a letter of comfort to the trustee uh, in relation to uh, the, what might be the remote possibility, but the possibility that there is some kind of challenge in claim staking that occurs within those 250 customers. Now, the experience of the trustee, Mazur, is that one in a thousand forms get challenged. And actually, um, a much smaller proportion get challenged successfully. So we're now down to, you know, well beyond that, well, well below that, and in circumstances where if the trustee, the trustee has said they will treat these forms as valid, um, 
and then through a claim staking process, if ultimately the trustee is uh, in a situation where they've paid one beneficiary and there's a successful challenge and they have to pay another, NAB Financial Planning has issued a letter of comfort about that. So therefore, we have dealt very comprehensively to the uh, client uh, issue and that was our prime concern, that through our own sloppiness, uh, we had created this situation which could affect the peace of mind of uh, 2,520 customers and uh, that's why we went to that process. And as I say, our customers have been fantastic returning forms and uh, helping get that situation back in order. And we saw earlier from um, documents we had on the screen that financial advisors who self-reported having been involved in incorrectly witnessing these forms received an amber conduct gate. Yes. Were there consequences further up the chain? Yes. Uh, can I ask that you uh, look at a document which is NAB 005 346 0001. This is a document entitled Wealth Advice Leadership Consequence Management. Uh, yes. You've seen this document before, Mr Hagar? Uh, yes, I have. It's actually three documents <coughs> packaged in one, but it's three different documents. Uh, perhaps we can um, make clear which are the different documents then. Is the first document a two-page document, which is 0001 and 0002? Yes. Um, do you know when that document was prepared? Uh, yes, it was prepared on the 2nd of uh, November through the Human Resources Division of NAB. And is the uh, next document the document that commences at 0003? Uh, yes. And runs through to 0005? No, the second document is the document at 0003. The single page? The single page. single page. And Correct. when was that document prepared, Mr Hagger? Uh, I'm not sure when it was prepared. I'm not sure. It, uh, I know when it was given to um, me, um, which was around the 3rd of uh, November. And the final document is the document that commences at 0004 and finishes at 0005? Correct. That's a file note, Andrew Hager, yes. Outcome and Broader Consequence Discussion with Greg Miller. Yes, and this document was authored by me on the 30th of uh, October, I think it was, when I met with uh, Greg Miller for his performance outcome conversation. Thank you. Um, now, perhaps before I ask questions about these documents, Commissioner, given that we've just sorted out the division between the documents, I might tender each of them. Uh, separately or as a bundle? I think separately sounds as if it would be appropriate. <laughs> Unless the Commissioner would prefer to do them as a bundle. <laughs> <laughs> Who am I to say? Uh, exhibit 2.186 will be Wealth Advice Leadership Consequence Management uh, 2 November 17 NAB 005 0001. The second document uh, should be described as what, Ms Orr? The second document is a document entitled uh, Sp Specific Concerns for Mr Tim, oh, sorry, for Tim Steele, given to Mr Hagger on the 3rd of November 2017. A uh, document described in that fashion being NAB 005346003 becomes Exhibit 2.187 and then Exhibit 2.188 will be the file note of 30 October uh, 17 NAB 005346004. Could I start with the first of those documents, yes. Mr Hagger, the two-page document prepared, I think you said, by the HR division? Yes. yes. Um, this document starts with a background section which recognises that there have been a number of risk and reputation challenges for wealth advice in FY17, yes. including a complex legacy issues, 
customer remediation, advice service fees and witnessing beneficiary nomination forms. There are also identified deficiencies in monitoring and supervision standards and <coughs> controls effectiveness. Yes. And we see that um, the HR team records that while the team has worked hard to identify, remediate and resolve the identified issues across the year, these have impacted the reputation of NAB and customer trust. There is much further work required to improve the key controls, improve risk and repair reputation. Yes. Senior leaders within Wealth Advice are accountable for setting the tone and culture and it is clear that the culture failed to ensure that advisors and support staff upheld the high standards we expect of them, particularly relating to witnessing beneficiary nomination forms. Yes. Um, do you agree with that statement, Mr Hagger, that senior leaders are accountable for setting the tone and culture in an organisation? Yes. And how would you describe the, cu the culture of NAB's wealth advice business? Uh, I'd describe it as uh, having progressed from being an advisor-centric culture to a customer-centric culture. Uh, we have more work to do, but uh, we, um, we are moving towards professionalism. I think that's been discussed in the Commission uh, so far. Uh, and um, it, in, it uh, revolves around the customer, as you've seen in the response to this issue. The document has a separate heading which is approach to applying consequence as a result of issues identified and records that a number of key senior stakeholders have been deeply involved in determining the appropriate consequence to be applied for people leaders within wealth advice. Yes. And the stakeholders include you. Yes. Uh, and Mr Steele, whose name we've seen on other uh, documents already. Yes. Now. Um, can I ask you to turn to the second page where we see a table setting out consequences that were to apply to different leadership groups? Yes. Can you explain that table to us, Mr Hagger? Sure. Uh, this, do you mean the, this, sorry, there's two tables there, so. I'm sorry, I'm talking about the one uh, that appears first on the page. Oh, sure, okay, so this is, uh, if you look at the, uh, organisation structure uh, within the wealth advice area. We start there with the wealth advice leadership team, which was Greg Miller's leadership team. Mr Miller reported to me at that time. Uh, within that leadership team, there's then the listing, the next four relate to areas within the wealth advice team, so it's, it's the leadership teams of those leaders. Uh, and then... Uh, clear, so that's advice partnerships, yes. advice services, yes. wealth distribution yes. and NAB financial planning. Yes. Yes. And then uh, the... Uh, oh, and sorry, I sh if you just jump the next one and go to direct advice leadership team, that is also um, part of the leadership team of Wealth Advice. Thank you. So Wealth Advice had those five arms, if you will. And then the NAB Financial Planning Regional Wealth Executives and National Client Manager, that's the RWEs that we've <coughs> referred to through this case study uh, so far, who report into NAB Financial Planning and play a leadership role in uh, managing the uh, advisors. So that's the regional wealth executives? Correct. And we see that this table records a risk outcome for each of those categories of leaders? Yes. Uh, um, the only uh, group that had a outcome of not achieved was the wealth distribution leadership <coughs> team. Can you explain Correct. that result? Uh, the fact that it was not achieved or yes. the fact that... Yes, so uh, these are risk outcomes that are um, assessed by the Chief Risk Officer and through the Risk uh, Division and they look at uh, a range of um, uh, risk indicators in the various areas, the actions that each um, leadership team undertook to, to take during the year, the effectiveness of the results of those and 
uh, through that um, arrives at a uh, an outcome decision, and their outcome decision in relation to wealth distribution was not uh, achieved. What we, what we want to see there is achieved, I assume. Correct. And then the next one down, the next, next less satisfactory outcome is partially it's achieved. It's partially achieved. And, and I think partially yeah. achieved and partial are similar. Um, I'm not sure of the difference between partially achieved and partial. I think that's referring to one and the same thing. But we can see that where the group um, achieved the risk outcome, there was no consequence for their um, incentive payment. Correct. And where they only partially achieved uh, the risk outcome, there was a reduction in their incentive payment of either 25% or 10%. Correct. But then we have the wealth distribution leadership team. Yes. Who have a not achieved rating for their risk outcome. Yes. Um, can you explain why they received <coughs> that risk outcome and what the consequence of that outcome was? Uh, I can't recall the exact reasons why the wealth distribution leadership team had a not achieved risk um, as or, um, but the um, uh, yes, I'm, um, I, I don't recall in relation to that, Ms. Or. I'm Who's in the wealth distribution leadership team, Mr. Hagger? Uh, that team at that time was uh, led by Mr. Jeff uh, Rogers. Um, the reason why I'm struggling to remember a little is that that area does not form part of my division today. I, I can't remember the specifics around that particular division. It's quite a small uh, division and it's involved in um, the uh, engagement with independent financial advisors outside our um, NAB financial planning and aligned uh, network, but I, I can't recall the specifics of that rating. All right. Uh, could we move to the second document, which is the document headed specific concerns for Tim Steele? Yes. We've seen that Mr Steele was the general manager of NAB Financial Planning. Yes. Uh, and this document contains a note from Mr Steele to Greg Miller and yes. HR. Yes. And Greg Miller, I think you said, was um, within the Wealth Advice Leadership Collective. Did he lead that group? Yes, Greg, Greg Miller led Wealth Advice yes. and NAB Financial Planning is in that and Tim Steele was reporting to Greg Miller at that time. Okay, so this is Mr Steele reporting to his superior, Correct. Mr Miller. Correct. And we see that Mr Steele says to Mr Miller in the third paragraph down, in terms of the broader leadership team, LT? Yes, what, what is that's it? the NAB Financial Planning LT. What's LT, Mr. Oh, sorry, Hagen? leadership team. Leadership well. team and regional wealth executives. Yes. I am concerned about the cultural impact to both overall engagement and the potential reluctance of team members to raise future issues which could contravene NAB's whistleblower policy, given the likely perceived unfairness of the consequences and corresponding lack of trust in senior leadership to support our people. Yes. So this was Mr Steele expressing concern about consequences imposed at the leadership level in response to these um, incidents? Yes. And this is the nature of the concerns that he expressed? Yes. Uh, and uh, Mr Miller expressed a similar view in his discussions with you, which we see from your file note in yes. the third document. Yes. Uh, and you record in your file note at 0004 uh, under the heading two, shaving of multiples for wealth advice leaders, second sentence, uh, that Mr Miller was very much opposed to any implications for wealth advice leadership team members and their direct reports. Yes. He said that this was an important cultural symbol and that what the organisation was really encouraging then was for Ben Noms, beneficiary nominations style issues, to be swept under the carpet in future. He said we risked key departures and all at a time when there's a possibility we will look to sell the advisory business or parts of it uh, in the coming year. Yes. And what was your response to those views, Mr Hagger? Uh, 
Well, my response to those views is uh, that there's an expression, um, uh, everything is leadership's fault. Uh, it's, it's for leaders to set the tone. So what we've done here is followed all the way through from Mr Main's situation through to finding a more entrenched practice which had occurred within the division. And that uh, we, we are actually delighted with Tim Steele's leadership through this process because he didn't waver in going through the customer remediation, in going through the uh, impacts and consequences for uh, those individuals who had been involved in the practice uh, and uh, in striking what we thought was a proportionate uh, response to this uh, situation and making clear to uh, the employees that this was wrong behaviour and here's how it needs to be done. So, uh, so the question then comes, which is really what Mr Miller was asking, well, why then are we shaving his uh, performance multiple bonus, bonus yes. and those of other people? And the answer is, well, it's happened on... Uh, you know, he, in his case, he'd been a leader for a relatively short time. The broader leadership team, uh, there were some members who had been there for quite a period of time. And uh, so my response here says, well, for example, on the executive leadership team from time to time, uh, I've experienced shavings of, um, uh, of, of bonuses for things I've either not directly been involved with or involved in finding and fixing. And there, there's sort of in some ways an unreasonableness to it, but it's fair, it's what our customers would expect of us, that they often look to, well, what's happening at the management level and what's happening to the leadership level. Don't just penalise the people involved in the practice, look to the management and leadership layers and make an adjustment there. And so my response to uh, Mr Miller on this matter and to Mr Steele when I met with him the following Monday was to say, I have sympathy, this is what I want to see. I want to see issues surfaced, customers protected and consequences. And the fact that that may impact a multiple in one year, which I think is, is uh, um, fair, even if it feels unreasonable, that actually uh, sets up, uh, I think, leaders for success uh, going forward because they've done the right thing. They might have a reduced multiple one year, but I would say Mr Steele's stocks rose in our organisation by his leadership of this matter, and that's probably <coughs> self-evident by the fact that he now reports uh, directly to me and is on my leadership team. You said you were delighted with the way he had handled this, uh, but Mr yes. Steele uh, was not delighted with the consequence that was applied to him, which was a shaving of his bonus. But you maintain well, that actually that should he, occur. Sorry, I, I should add, he was accepting of the uh, bonus. At, at the time that he wrote this, he, he thought that a bigger adjustment to his bonus was going to occur than what ultimately happened. So, What was the size of the adjustment to his bonus ultimately, Mr Hagger? Uh, well, his uh, short-term incentive multiple for last year was uh, something like 0.7 six or 0.77, it's it's 10 per cent less than 0.85, whatever that works out to be. So his bonus was shaved by approximately 10 per cent Correct. as a result of these events? Correct. All right. Um, so uh, uh, you held your ground and maintained yes. that these leadership consequences should occur in yes. the face of um, opposition from Mr Steele and Mr Miller? Yes, I, I sympathised, but I stood my ground. You had to work to persuade your CEO as well, didn't you, Mr Hagger? Uh, not really. He, the, so the first uh, document uh, was actually discussed with the CEO on, with Mr Thorburn on the 2nd of... Oh, sorry, the 3rd of uh, November. Mm -hmm. And so his, he had... Let me go back a step. He had been involved with me in the rating of Mr Miller. And then he would, in relation to the uh, other leaders, um, he said to me, I want to see the uh, consequences and I want to approve them. 
So, Just pausing there, what was the consequence for Mr Miller? You've explained for Mr Steele. Oh, uh, Mr Miller received no bonus. Thank you. I'm sorry, carry on. So then Mr Thorburn, this, this first document at 0001 and 0002 uh, was the subject of discussion between uh, myself, uh, Linda Dean, who's the Head of Perf Performance and Reward, or the Executive General Manager of Performance and Reward uh, at NAB, and, uh, and Mr Thorburn. And Mr Thorburn on the Friday, uh, which I think was the 3rd of November, uh, we had a, a meeting. And when you say I, I needed to persuade him, uh, he was comfortable with uh, everything in that table that we just went through. But with one question, he said, have we reduced the incentives uh, enough for the regional wealth executives? And so um, that was something that I reflected on. I spoke with Mr Steele uh, and with uh, the HR division and I went back to Mr Thorburn on, uh, it might have been that evening actually, and said to him, no, I think that's, I think we've struck the right balance there, and he agreed. We have that email exchange between you oh, and okay. Mr Thorburn. I can show you, Mr Hagger, which is NAB 005 309 0009. Thank you. Yes, this looks like the exchange. Yes. Um, so we can see there, there was an email sent by you at 9.24pm on Friday the 3rd of November. Yes. This chain doesn't record who it was sent to, but it appears to have been sent to Mr Thorburn and Ms Dean. Yes. And we see Mr Thorburn's response to your email on Monday morning. Yes. Uh, he says he's accepting of your review and the conclusions, particularly as people have had an additional 10% reduction through the STI multiple being 90%. And can yes. you explain that first? Why was there already the 10% reduction? Oh, I see. Um, so this this will sound like a very sort of high level. It's a, an overall NAB um, short-term yes, incentive comp. So short-term incentives at NAB have two multipliers involved. So you have a target mm -hmm. bonus. And the first index or factor is the group multiple and the second index is the individual multiple. So if the target is 100 and the group multiple ends up being 0.9 and the individual multiple ends up being 0.9, then you get 100 times 0.9 times 0.9, which ends up at uh, 80 or 81. 81, I think it is. So, uh, the NAB board, as reflected in the NAB annual financial report, in the remuneration report, uh, made a determination for the year just past, um, finished 30 September 2017, that the group SDI multiple would be 90%. And the reason why they did that, as outlined in the financial report, was mainly due to compliance factors in as much as, I mean, there's a number of judgments involved to get to that, uh, that point, but, uh, you know, NAB had um, met a number of targets uh, in relation to uh, financial and uh, risk, uh, sorry, financial and uh, uh, people uh, engagement, customers, etc. I'm not familiar with all the algorithms, but a key thing of that a key message from the NAB board to management was the multiple will be 90%, not 100%, and in particular, we have been concerned about compliance matters. And that included uh, nominated beneficiaries, this matter. And when I took to the board risk committee this matter, which I did on uh, the 7th of June, the board was meeting in Mildura, uh, I, uh, when, when I explained to the board the matter, the failure of discipline, that it was a cultural matter, the, um, the board noted this is uh, another issue in our wealth and they took that into their determination 
at the end of the year. Yes, I see. Um, so that was a factor that Mr Thorburn was taking into account in his assessment of your recommendations. Yes. That the group STI multiple had already been reduced by 10 per cent yes. uh, as a result of compliance issues. Of oh, this was one, yes. Um, and Mr Thorburn then says to you, I think this means we can say those who were involved in this issue have had somewhere between 20% and 100% of their bonuses reduced for this year. Yes, and that's true. And your email to him, which we see below on the Friday night, um, you say to him that, as promised, you've personally probed further into uh, Mr Thorburn's challenge regarding retail, I'm sorry, regional wealth executives consequence yes and then you forward a note sent by linda in support of your recommendation to stick with what had already been suggested as the regional wealth executives consequence yes, yes. Um, so the challenge by mr thorburn was the challenge you've described earlier in yes. relation to the regional wealth executives yes. consequence yes thank you i tender that document commissioner Emails between Hacker and Thorburn of 3 and 6 November 17, NAB 005, sorry, NAB 005 309 009 will be exhibit 2.189. Mr Hagger, did you also have a financial consequence imposed on you as a result of these events? Yes. Uh, can I ask that you be shown NAB 092001-1000. These are um, minutes of a meeting of the board on the 4th of October 2017. Uh, the NAB board, yes. The NAB board. Limited board. Thank yes. you. And at 1006, we see that the board approved financial year 17 performance outcomes for the group CEO's direct reports. Yes. I'll just wait till that comes on the screen, Mr Hagger. And it records in that table, we see the reference to you as one of the key management personnel on the left hand side. Yes. It reports that reports that you achieved your performance outcome? Yes. What does that mean, Mr Hagger? Uh, it means looking across the gambit of my responsibilities, um, the determination of Mr Thorburn and the board was that I had achieved um, the um, uh, performance goals that I uh, had uh, set for me for the year. And we see that the STI multiple, the multiple for your bonus, um, is recorded as 0.8. Yes. Do we understand um, from that, so you two were starting from the 0.9 group multiplier? Yes. And we see from footnote two to this table that your individual multiple was adjusted by 0.5? Yes, this, this is showing the net, sort of the net net of the group and the individual arriving at 0.8. Yes. And the deduction of 0.5 is said to balance continuing wealth risk management issues against strong performance on other dimensions, including industry leadership on a number of matters. Yes. Um, so what um, uh, reduction in bonus was applied to you as a result of these events? Uh, the reduction was... Uh, <coughs> I, I would have is, to do the maths, but point. Yes, this 0. is the 5. aggregate, but there would have been a reduction to your individual multiplier, is that right? Correct. If, if it were not for these uh, events, I probably need a calculator in front of me, but if it were not for these events, um, I would have received a higher uh, incentive. Um, and the way to calculate that would be 0. 0.05 uh, times 1.2 million. So I'm not sure what that, I think that might be $60,000. Mazur. Thank you. Which left you with the variable component, the bonus for that year of $960,000. Correct. I tender that document, Commissioner. Minutes of the Board of NAB, limited 4 October 17, NAB 092001, 1000, Exhibit 2.190. Could I 
Um, just ask you some more general questions now, Mr Hager, about some other matters that you've dealt with in your statement in relation to NAB's financial advice business. Yes. Um, you've set out information in your statement about the number of financial advisers employed by NAB in each year since 2008. Yes. And we see that if we start in 2008, there were 538 advisers. Uh, this is an yes. extra A to your statement, if that assists. Yes, I'm uh, amongst it. I haven't... Uh... Here we are, 538. Yes, Ms. Orr. And that went up in 2013. We see it was 600. Yes. And it continued going up in 2014 and 15. Yes. But then if we turn to the next page, we see that currently in 2018, there are only 383. Yes. Financial advisors. So why has NAB decreased the amount or the number of its financial advisors? Uh, I think there's two key reasons. One is we've lifted education standards, so the pool to uh, recruit uh, has uh, diminished. So we've had less advisors coming uh, in. And then secondly, we've had departures for a range of uh, reasons. Uh, uh, some of them of our making in the sense that in lifting standards there are some uh, financial planners um, that for whatever reason might decide they want to work elsewhere or exit uh, the industry. In other cases, uh, an advisor may simply choose to uh, work somewhere else. Um, we've seen references in at least one other document to consideration by NAB of divesting itself of its financial advice business. Yes. Is that something that NAB is considering? Um, well, I think uh, I sometimes get asked uh, that question because there's been some uh, media speculation. Obviously, um, uh, NAB is continually looking at our overall uh, portfolio, um, but um, as all, there's no announcement to make here today in the Royal Commission. The matter under consideration. Might be some market sensitive information which <laughs> we're inquiring about. I think we might need to be a little. The reason for my in inquiry, Mr Hager, is I'm interested in whether you think that it's desirable for the provision of financial advice to be separated from entities like the big banks or AMP, um, which also issue financial products. Oh, I see. Well, firstly, I agree that advice and uh, product are two separate uh, things. In, inside NAB, we have different areas um, that uh, Mr Lawrence oversees product, I oversee advice. Um, so we understand the distinctions and we manage the uh, inherent conflicts of interest that can occur. The flip side of that is that uh, customers uh, take um, uh, typically a lot of comfort out of the fact that they're dealing with a big institution. Um, we, we have seen that where, as a bank, we have got it wrong, we have compensated customers. Um, if we have a determination in the customer's favour at uh, the ombudsman, NAB pays up. If we lose a court case, uh, if the matter's even got to that point, hardly any do, but if they do, you know, NAB pays up. Um, so uh, customers, um, and, and, and we have many, uh, appreciate the fact that a big institution is standing behind the advice, that there are quality standards, and that uh, in the event that things go wrong, which is actually rare, but when it does happen, as we saw in uh, this case, that NAB will act to protect customers. So they're all the, they're, there's those two factors, the managing the conflicts uh, of interest and the, also uh, the, um, uh, the customer benefits of dealing with a big organisation. And those things are on our minds uh, all the time and you know, have, have been for a long time. You've referred in your statement to the Customer Response Initiative. Yes. Uh, that was something that NAB established in 2015. Yes. And it's a program that aims to identify and remediate customers at risk of loss due to inappropriate advice. Yes. Um, and as part of that customer response initiative, 
in May 2015, NAB appointed an independent customer advocate. Yes, that was Professor Dimity Kingsford-Smith, who I referred to earlier. Evidence. Uh, and in late 2017, I want to take you to some recommendations that the independent customer advocate made about the customer response initiative. Yes. I could ask that you be shown NAB 005 Are you familiar with this document, Mr Hagger? Uh, yes, I am. I was um, present when this document was presented to the NAB Principal Board. Yes, and there is no date on this document, but we know that it was considered by the NAB Principal Board on the 9th of November 2017. Yes. Yes, so late last year. And we see at 0087, the first page, um, yes. that... Uh, the customer advocate uh, uh, in this memo to the board explains that the customer response initiative, this is the second paragraph under CRI Insights, yes. has not progressed adequately since its commencement in mid-2015, determining the number of advisers of concern and therefore customers at risk is ongoing. On the 27th of April 2017, the Advice and Licensee Board asked management to secure adequate funding and plan for the CRI to be completed by September 2020. That timing was based on the review of 33 advisers. However, there is no practical likelihood of this without a significant increase in resources. At end of October 2017, there were 24 advisers under CRI review, with a projection of this increasing to 48 at the end of November 2017. There remain in excess of 540 advisers waiting to be assessed as to whether they will be in scope or not. At best, customer remediation is less than 10% complete, and this is largely for want of financial support to date. Management has been unable to determine or provide a whole or life cost or commit to funding which is plausible for a target end date. Uh, now, did the board, in response to this paper, accept that the customer response initiative uh, was proceeding far too slowly? Uh, yes. Um, now, I want to take you to the uh, board's response, but before I do that, can I just ask you to also direct your attention to a passage over the page at 0088. Uh, so the customer response initiative analysis that's referred to in the first full paragraph there reveals that years of poor conduct were tolerated with ineffective consequence management for advisers now under review. Poor record keeping of client files continues to obstruct complaints, remediation, management assurance and risk controls, siloed and difficult to retrieve data about monitoring and supervision, events and consequence management have made it harder than it should be to make timely decisions about advisers of concern. Yes. So these, I've taken you to two aspects of these um, concerns expressed by the independent customer yes. advocate to the NAB principal board. Yes. I'll tender that document, Commissioner. Memorandum for NAB principal board from customer advocate wealth. NAB 0052170087 is exhibit 2.191. Can I now take you to management's response, which is NAB 0052180001 on the 26th of October 2017. Thank you. Oh, I, I'm sorry if I didn't give the number for that. I did. <coughs> Could I ask you to look firstly at the appendix, which is an appendix expressing views from the Chief Risk Officer, Mr Damien Murphy, which is 0003. Yes. We see there that um, Mr Murphy 
refers to a number of matters and the sixth of those matters is that, uh, I'll just wait for it to come onto the screen, is that ASIC's approach to financial advisors across the industry and particularly across the big five has shifted over the last <coughs> two years, including with NAB. This involves challenges to all revenue streams and services <coughs> attached to financial advisors. In particular, the conduct focus involves ensuring no harm to any customer, with the reversal of onus of demonstrating appropriate advice and service now required from the institution. Just pausing there, wasn't NAB itself always required to demonstrate that its advisers were providing appropriate advice? Uh, yes. There's been no reversal of onus, has there, Mr Hagger? Oh, I think, um, well, firstly, these are, these are Mr Murphy's uh, words. Your but chief I, risk officer. Our chief risk officer, who we referred to earlier, yes. yes. So uh, I think what he's saying there is in the past with ASIC, whether it be through identifying advisers of concern or whether it be through a complaint and dispute resolution process, what would happen is that a customer issue would surface and that would be dealt with yes. and that would be overseen. Yes. What uh, Mr Murphy is talking about here is actually saying rather than matters surfacing and then yes. being governed, it's saying we're looking at uh, everything, so prove that you provided appropriate advice rather than prove that you're remediating inappropriate advice that you know about. This is reflecting, isn't it, Mr Murphy's view that um, NAB's approach previously had been to assume nothing was wrong until a customer complained? Uh, no, he's not saying that because, the, as, as you mentioned, Mazur, uh, we instigated, and actually I instigated, the Customer Response Initiative in 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was... Um, Mr Murphy... Uh, let me even go back a step further than that. In August 2014, I had brought Deloitte in to work with us uh, on where our quality advice framework was up to, and that was us proactively looking at the Senate Economics Committee uh, report, which I think was chaired by Mr Bishop, in relation to CBA. And as a result of that, uh, seeing that report in relation to another bank, we decided to put a mirror um, against our own activities. And through that, we prepared a report. And in that report, Mr Murphy, uh, in his Chief Risk Officer um, comments to that report, said, we can't be sure that there isn't more inappropriate advice in our back book. I think you're familiar with the term back book. Yes, I am. So therefore, we instigated the Customer Response Initiative and we brought in Deloitte to uh, and, and worked with ASIC and worked with the independent customer advocate to scope that up. And that's the report that's being talked about here. So I think that to help the Commission understand what this document is saying and what the discussion was about is that very deliberately the Customer Response Initiative program is tackling first and foremost issues of where, where we believe there may be customer detriment and going to the high risk advisor situations. And that's where we have targeted the work. And so when Professor Kingsford Smith talks about 10% completion possibly, she's referring to the, potentially the number of customers who may be remediated uh, by the end if there's inappropriate advice. But she's not saying that the compensation that we have paid so far is only 10% no. complete. Quite, quite the contrary. So, so far we have spent $50 million on the customer response initiative to try to find areas of inappropriate advice. And I think you're across the statistics. So far we have found uh, $19 million of compensation that we have offered uh, to clients. And so we will continue with that process, but the core Professor Kingsford Smith in her report speaks to a number of positive things about uh, our wealth division and the work done and the changes made, but her number one 
point to the board was this program needs to move faster. And in this document, I agreed and the board agreed. And so we added further funding to the program. And that happened uh, late last year. Yes. Uh, after the customer risk initiative was set up in the middle of 2015. Yes. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Memorandum for the Board of NAB Limited Management Response to Exhibit 2.191, uh, NAB 005218 001 is Exhibit 2.192. Um, I have no further questions for Mr Hagger, Commissioner. Just before the document comes down, as it just has, Mr Hagger, um, can I direct your attention to the second page and paragraph 7? Uh, do you see paragraph 7? In the middle of that paragraph, there is a sentence, the business model associated with aligned advisors needs to be reviewed in the current environment. Are you able to explain that to me uh, or amplify it in any respect? Yes, Commissioner. So uh, the Aligned Advice Network uh, consists of small businesses all around Australia, which are advisory businesses. And through our licence, the licence of, for example, uh, GWEMAS, which Ms Orr referred to yesterday, we stand behind the advice of those advisors. And we, we stand behind appropriate advice and we stand behind inappropriate uh, advice. And in return for that, we receive a licensee fee and we provide uh, training and various tools which help those practices to thrive. To the extent that there is inappropriate advice in the network, the risk reward equation, it's a bit like an insurance risk reward equation, uh, looks different today to what it looked like in the pre-FOFA days, because in the pre-FOFA days, and in fact, I'd probably have to go back even further than that, but in the days of product economics into the advice world, the risk return equation was quite different. Now we see a different return profile and a different risk profile. I think that's what Mr Murphy is referring to, Commissioner. And a, a change in profiles that is working against uh, NAB uh, remaining in uh, that kind of arrangement, pointing against remaining in it? Yes, and I don't want to be too specific about no. NAB, but I think, yes, for big uh, organisations, and I think this is something that ASIC is also turning its mind to, and APRA, <laughs> Because uh, if you go back 20, 30 years, I think in Treasury and other arms of uh, government, it would be said that it's good that big institutions are standing behind these small businesses. They're very important around Australia. If that goes away, then there's a more fragmented environment for um, the regulators to oversee. And also it makes it harder if, if ASIC lifts its standards currently in a particular area, as they did in November, we can then provide training right across a network. But if those small businesses were sort of doing that themselves, um, the best ones will be able to do that, but you can see there's a fragmentation. Yes. Is there anything arising out of that, Ms. No, thank you, Commissioner. Does any party other than NAB seek leave to examine Mr. Hagger? Mr. Young? Uh, no questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank Hagger. You. You are you may step down and you're excused further attendance, I think, Ms Orr? Yes, yes. thank you, Thank you, Mr Haggard. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, the second entity through which we will examine improper conduct of financial advisers is ANZ. Uh, perhaps we could have a moment to reset the bar table. I come back at 10 to midday. Thank you, Commissioner.